Hello and welcome to Beer Tier, the German engineer. Explains, oxygen not included. Today we are back, as promised, with the Sani shells as well as off screen right now the oak shells. So I would say let's just jump right into it and see what we can do with those two critters. And here we are. So let's turn the overlay back on and let's pause the game and let's take a look at what we have built here. First of all, everything that's on the right side of this wall right here is completely optional. All this here is, is for our dupe to live. Who do we have here? Kreo Wak. Yes, he needs a space to live in, to sleep in, and of course use the bathroom and whatnot. And we have a few nutrient bars. And on the right side over here, we also have an auto sweeper where we actually get our polluted dirt in for our poke shells. But that is, of course, beside the point. All we are focusing on is this left side right here. So let's get started with our F2 overlay. And of course, all we need to do is power all the stuff right here the total usage is about 870 watts this is basically all there is there is not a hell of a lot else we have a tiny little bit of automation so let's zoom in here and let's take a look we have two critter sensors right here one on the left side and one on the right side the one on the right goes to this door here on the bottom the top one needs to be locked or made out of airflow tiles or something similar where the one on the left side is hooked up to this mechanized airlock right here down here on the bottom left, we have a timer sensor and the timer sensor is connected to a conveyor rail output so we can actually feed our critters at least halfway automatically. So that is what that looks like. So why do we have this here set up the way it is and how is it set up in the first place? The left critter sensor is set up to below eight critters and if it falls below eight, so if a one of our critters dies, this door here opens. When this door here opens, this auto sweeper right here can reach this incubator and can actually put an egg in there or a pinch row in this particular case so we can actually replenish this area here on the left the one on the right side is set up to below nine that is right if we are below nine critters this door here will be open if we are above nine critters we are shutting this door here and the reason for it is that these things here get pretty aggressive so we need to make sure that our dupes stay out that is the general idea of course there is a possibility that a dupe is on the inside but the possibility is extremely low because our dupes are just in here to groom and then they immediately go back out and do something else around the base. Next on the list is our conveyor overlay and we can see here on the right that just built a conveyor loader that is just there so we can actually feed our poke shells right here. And once again we have this timer sensor right here to be set up to feed them properly. Then over here on the left side we have two conveyor loaders. One can be reached by the left one and one can be reached by the right auto sweeper. Both of them lead to the same rail and going over to the left. And here we are just sorting out what we are getting out from our poke shells. So what do we get out of our poke shells? Well, we get four things. We get sand, we get poke shell moats, we get pinch rows, and we get sandy pinch rows. So how do we actually get those sandy pinch rows? Well, you may have noticed that our poke shells here live in water, and that is highly important. If I click on one of those critters right here, they are, by the way, completely groomed and tamed, so that is very good. Down here on the bottom, it says egg chances. We have pinch row at 76%. Those are relatively newly spawned, so don't worry about it. That will decrease quite drastically, relatively quickly. We have oak pinch rows here at 0%, and it says it wells in ethanol. Of course, that is not the case, so that's not gonna happen. But the chance for sandy pinch rows is drastically increased if they dwell in water. And this is why we have this setup right here. We have a total of 11 tiles in this particular setup in which our poke shells live and walk around. The only time they leave the water is when they come to the grooming station. So right here, we have a total of three spaces where they are not in the water. Three out of the water and 11 inside of water. Highly important is that the water needs to be above 500 kilograms. So in my case, I put 600 kilograms in there just to be safe. In this particular setup here, of course, our poke shells are completely fed and groomed and tamed and all that good stuff. There is nothing out of the ordinary here and we are just extracting as much from them as we can. All the poke shell molds all the sand and of course all the eggs and what we are doing with those eggs of course is up to you in your particular base i'm just sorting them over here so we can visualize it a little bit easier what we can get how you build it is of course completely up to you and of course it needs to fit in your base let's take a look at another setup 
The next setup I want to look at is this setup right here. So what is it and what does it do? Well, it is a half starved wrench. Let's take a look. In our F2 overlay, we have our conductive wire coming around to an auto sweeper as well as a conveyor loader. The conveyor loader is literally set to everything. Everything there is, we want to grab it and we just want to extract that out of here. And of course, down here on the bottom, we have our food coming in. But food is not the only thing that should come in here whenever you use this setup yourself because how we want to do it is we want to drop the pinch rows, the eggs of the poke shells directly into this chamber and let them hatch in there. That is the general idea. You would probably build not one conveyor chute, but a second one, have your polluted dirt come from somewhere and your eggs from somewhere else, just because we have a timer sensor right here. And our timer sensor is set to 14. So we're putting about 280 kilograms, 14 times 20 is basically the math that we are doing here into this chamber and the reason for it is that currently i have let's take a look real quick in the room overlay a total of eight critters in there that's just a random number i just pressed the mouse button apparently eight times that is literally pure coincidence that it is eight so why are we doing this here well because it requires no labor and it still works when we take a look here at the reproduction rate it is two percent per cycle and we have a living span of 100 cycles that means out of every single poke shell that we have in here we will get one egg in their lifetime out of it because they need five cycles from the time they hatch until they are fully grown up and at that point we will need another 50 cycles until we can actually get an egg out of it at this point they are 55 years old and then another 45 years later they're dead and we will get a molt out of it it's literally this simple but they're also dwelling in water and we can see that these guys here are already at 61 percent and they're only nine years old and I spawned them in here, obviously completely fresh. It is literally this simple. That is a setup that you could use. And once again, you just extract everything out of here that you need. Just with a conveyor rail element sensor and a conveyor shutoff. It's literally this simple. On one line, you just filter out whatever comes along. And if it is not what you desire, it will move on along the rail. That would be a setup that can be used viably in a normal game. Let's move on to the next one. Right here's the next setup that I want to look at and it's the exact same thing as before over here on the right. The only difference is instead of 11, we have now a total of 21 tiles available for our poke shells to run around in this water here, which will of course do two things. First, it will increase the time the poke shell spends in the water because it does not go over here that often. But at the same time, it will also increase the time for the poke shell to take to come over here, which increases dupe labor. And there is a third thing that happens. This auto sweeper right here. Yes, this setup here, only the eggs that land in these five tiles right here will be picked up by this auto sweeper and put into the incubator. So if anything spawns further to the left over here, it will not be picked up. That is also true for the other setup, but the chance that that happens is drastically lower. Because once again, right here we are covering two, so we have 19 tiles left over where eggs could be spawned and this auto sweeper can't reach it. Where on the other setup we only have a total of 9. 11 negative 2 makes 9 tiles left over where the eggs could potentially spawn and our auto sweeper can't reach it and put it directly into the incubator. Because if we build this setup here, we will start with poke shells because that's what we find in the environment, but our Critter drop off here is of course not only set to poke shells but further down also to sandy shells because eventually the poke shells can die we have an own farm for our poke shells and we will go on and make a sandy shell farm out of it so let's move on to that and let's take a look what that actually looks like and here we are finally with our sandy shell wrench. So what are sandy shells and what is actually so different about them? Well, there are a couple things that we need to talk about. First of all, of course, when they die, we do not get a molt out of it. We rather get a tiny little bit of raw shellfish, 4000 kilocalories to be precise. So it is definitely not worth farming them for their food. Only 4000 kilocalories every 100 cycles. Yes, these things you also have a lifespan of 100 cycles is not not worth it unless you are literally starving them. You can star farm them, there is no question about it, and they will be dead after 50 cycles. At that point, it will be a little bit more worth it. The second thing is we can feed them slime, and that is very, very good because there is one special thing about them that we can see right here. We feed them 70 kilograms of polluted dirt, rot pile, or slime, and we will get 35 kilograms of sand out of it. That is a conversion rate of 50%. So we are losing quote unquote only 
50% of our input material and get sand out of it. Where with the normal poke shells as well as the oak shells later on, we only get 25%. But we will look at that in detail later again. And then the third and probably most interesting thing is that they actually clean germs out of water and other fluids. So let's grab us some water once again, 600 kilograms at 27 degrees, it doesn't matter. And let's give it, let's say 50,000 germs, just a random number. And let's replace this water in here with germy water. Now we have 50,000 germs in each and every tile. So let's see what our sandy shells are doing. And they immediately start the cleaning process and the cleaning process can be seen done by them waving their claws around in the air. And we can see that the germs are going down relatively drastically. So in theory, you could just put them into any fluid and clean out a few germs. That actually looks pretty fast at 50,000, but barely ever will you have only 50,000, especially if you have polluted water. So what if we make out of 50, 500,000. Let's see if it is still looking that impressive. There we go. And we are still cleaning it, but very, very slow. So I would personally say it is not a replacement for a chlorine room. There is something else about the things that you need to know about. So let's take a look at the next setup. And right here I have once again sandy shells and the sandy shells are this time living in polluted water instead of water. So let's take a look at their egg chances and we can see that the pinch row chance is at 100%. Yes, when it says it dwells in water, they mean actually literally clean water and nothing else but clean water. So that is important to keep in mind. Do not use salt water, do not use polluted water or anything else. Only actual normal water will work to actually get sandy pinch rows. So let's take a look at the oak shells. And right here we have our setup for our oak shells and of course our poke shells currently are running around in ethanol. This would be the start of how you set it up as before. And once again our credit drop off is of course set to poke shells as well as where our oak shells right here. But regardless this here is the setup for our oak shells and this is the only way that you will get them. Let's take a look at what the oak shells actually look like and what they do. And right here we have our oak shells running around and of course they couldn't be happier than they are right now. They are doing perfectly fine and currently they're at about 80% chance to get an oak pinch row, which is exactly what that should look like and we are getting a bunch of oak shell molts out of them. It's incredible. We already have 5.9 tons. I didn't spawn anything of it literally this is all produced by them directly six tons worth of it and we will take a look at what that actually means here in a second before we do that let's take a look in the actual database and let's start from the top not that far on the top but roughly around here our normal poke shells right here they have a comfort range of 15 to 70 degrees and a livable range of negative 30 to 100 so you should be able to accommodate it basically anywhere which is a very very nice of course their diet is polluted dirt or rot pile and they go from 70 kilograms to 35 kilograms and that is only true for polluted dirt. So this here as well as the sandy shells is the most efficient way to get sand from polluted dirt or rot pile. But if we move on to the sandy shells, of course, their comfort ranges and livable ranges are the exact same thing. But here we can add slime. And usually on most planetoids, you have slime laying around that you literally don't need for anything important. So might as well make some sand out of it to have more filtration medium. If we now move down to the oak shells, now it gets a little bit more complicated because we feed them 70 kilogram of anything and we only get 17.5 kilograms of sand out of it. But the reality is we are not here with the oak shells to get any sand out of it. What we want from them is their oak shell molds. So let's take a quick look what we can actually do with six tons of oak shell molds. And here we are with our oak shell molds. Again, six tons of it. We can go to a rock crusher and the rock crusher can make a lumber out of it. And the conversion rate is an unbelievable 100%, which means that six tons worth of oak shell molds. And by the way, those were produced by eight critters in less than 10 cycles. Just throwing that out there. It's quite incredible how much mold we get out of them. We can just set this here to forever. And then somebody like right here, Magenta will come by and just will bang that thing out. 
And as soon as magenta here is done, let's speed it up a tiny little bit. We will get 500 kilograms worth of lumber every single time, which makes those oak shells here extremely powerful if you want to produce ethanol and maybe make some power on the side. That is, of course, very, very good. And that is something you should keep in mind. That is a new source of wood and probably even better than arbor trees, in my opinion. So I truly hope you have fun with this setup. But that is all I have for you guys today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments down below or, of course, join my wonderful Discord channel and ask me or one of my beautiful community members directly. We are always happy to help. But if you enjoy the content, please subscribe to the channel, leave a like on the video, and again, don't forget to comment down below. And with that, I say thank you and peace.